Welcome to the Princeton Adult School class, Social Media Strategy for Authors. And uh, just as a little bit of an introduction, so we're, we're not gonna talk about how to use any one platform in any great detail. We're really gonna talk more about a strategy of using social media. And the reason why we're not talking about in detail any platform is any one of you may have a different opinion as which is the right platform for you, for your readers and your audience. So we're gonna talk about audiences. So we're not deep diving into how to use Facebook or how to use Twitter, any of those. You know, we're gonna mention them, but we're not gonna deep dive. But really what I want to be able to do is talk about a strategy that you can use for going forward and introduce you to a couple of tools that you can then pursue further on your own if you think that they are indeed appropriate for you. And so just as a way of introduction, uh, quickly introducing myself, and some of you may remember, um, we used to go to movie theaters and plays and the curtain would open and we'd get ourselves started. Hopefully that'll happen again soon. I'll just quickly tell you about me. I'm not gonna tell you a whole lot because that's not what this program is about, but I am an independent technology consultant. Uh, my company is Princeton Technology Advisors and I, I'm based in Princeton, New Jersey, Central New Jersey. And there's a bunch of tech stuff that we do for our clients. Our clients tend to be small business and not for profit organizations that don't have an IT department of their own. I do help them with their website. Um, I help them with some of their other technology services that they may have. Uh, maybe they have a project that they need a little bit of guidance or a project manager, I help with that. And I also help with email marketing and SEO or search engine optimization. Um, we're not gonna talk a great deal about search engine optimization unless all the questions come up and then I can, I've got some slides on that. Um, but uh, this is a long enough presentation. You may start to feel a little bit when we get to the end, like it's Thanksgiving, you feel full and you wanna step away from the table. So that's why I don't talk about SEO in great detail. But if you want and have questions about it, I'll be happy to ask, answer them. And also, while I, I have not written a book, I don't anticipate writing a book or anything on that level, I am a blogger. And so my website, uh, that's my blog site, uh, which actually connects to my website now. And so I do blog on technology topics, but I write to the layperson. So I'm not writing to technology people with acronyms and all that kind of stuff because my audience tends to be people that are not technical in nature on their own. So you're welcome to go take a look at that a little bit later. So let's talk a little bit about what social media really is. And I found this definition and I thought it was wonderful. So I'll just read it. I don't always like reading off my slides word for word, but I thought this was very good. So social media is the collective of online communication channels, and we'll be talking about communication channels, dedicated to community-based input, interaction, content sharing, and collaboration. And when I saw that, and I read it a couple of times originally, it was a couple of years ago, I really thought it, it was a very good description of social media. I liked it. The only problem I had with it is it's a little complicated if you're not part of this community. So I kind of boiled it down. And in boiling it down, what I came up with is you're really just using the internet to share information. That's what you're doing. So um, the community, the communication channels, those are the different tools that are out there. We'll talk about them. And you'll share or post or write or get the information out there. And that's what you're doing. And the internet is your technical means for getting it out there. So using the internet to share information or people are. And this is a, a strategy that I subscribe to. It's called spoke and hub. And if you can kind of think of a bicycle wheel, in the middle is the hub and the spug, spokes are on the outside and the tire is outside of that. And the tire turns around on the hub. And I'm of the opinion, that, and I agree with this, that the hub is your website. Because if you have a website, you can write about a lot of different things. You could have a different web page about each either topic or subtopic or category. But if you use some of these other things, like if you start using social media sites or email or public relations or paperclip or affiliate marketing or any of these others that you can put out on the spoke, generally the posts that you put out are smaller and of a singular focus. And so those social media sites those email marketing, those traditional marketing campaigns that are on the spoke, they're gonna reference back to your website. And so that's what the spoke is used for to go back and forth. And then your website may direct 
your reader of your website to one of your other spokes. So kind of go up and around. So not quite uh, really truly relational, although it is a little bit where the center of your uh, online strategy becomes your website. If you don't yet have a website, you've got questions about it, certainly feel free to ask about that on the way as we go through this. And really, why is online presence so important? Well, for the first thing, your readers, your followers, people looking for people like you, they expect you to be there. When they look for somebody, and think about the way you might use a Google search or searching uh, on a um, on a social media platform, um, you will only find people that are accessible. And so they, we all expect people to be found, the ones we need to be found. And so that's one reason why it's important. People are searching for products and information online all the time. And just think about how you're using the internet, whether you're using Google or Bing or Ask or Yahoo or any of those, <clears throat> or even if you're on specific shopping websites or other places, you're searching all the time for information. Maybe you're getting referrals to services or information. And a professional website, a professional social media site, really gives you and your brand a credibility. So you have you know, street cred, you have online cred, and uh, it becomes very important. Also, you can use it as a platform for demonstrating what's important to you. You can demonstrate your interests, your knowledge, uh, your expertise, um, your, any, any of the information that you want to get out to your audience. If you are not yet known, this is where people begin to find out about you because they haven't heard about you. But maybe when they do their own online searches, when they're searching the Internet on their own, they may begin to find you. And every once in a while, I do hear from someone who says that they're very afraid to be on social media because they don't want any of their personal information to get out. They don't want to be hacked. And so in case that's in the back of your mind right now, I would say don't worry about that at all. And the reason why is you're not putting your personal information out. You're not going to publish uh, your social security number, your credit card numbers, your bank account. You're not putting that out. You're putting out information that is important to your reading audience. Maybe you'll put a phone number, maybe you'll put an email address, but you're not gonna put your personal information. So don't worry about being hacked just because you're gonna be online. Now, the information that may be out there, or that may be vulnerable, it's out there anyway, but you're not the reason why that is. And what's also funny, people said would say, you know, it's not the way it used to be. You never could find people before. Yes, you could. It was called the uh, phone book used to be a big thick white pages that had your phone number in it and your home address. So we used to put that information out without worry. So um, uh, just keep that in mindset. Also, if you are not found online, you're irrelevant. Now, I don't mean to say at all that your writing is irrelevant or not of a, a good quality, not worthy of being published. That's not what I mean at all. You know, if you have a voice and you have a message, you want to get that out there. But if someone is going to search for someone like you, if someone is going to search for the genre that you're writing in, if someone's going to search for a topic of interest that's a topic of interest for you, for you as well as them, and you're not available to be found, they're not going to contact you. They're not going to buy what you're, you're, you're writing. You're just not functionally relevant to them because you're not seen. So you do want to be found online. And I can tell you with 100% certainty it's true. And the reason why, I wrote it in bold red. And if I wrote it in bold red, it must be true. And I think I read it on the internet. So that must make it true also. By the way, not everything that you read on the internet is true. You have to use your own filters. Okay. So to benefit from using social media, any social media, you need to have a strategy. You need to have a strategy that really takes into account what you are trying to achieve. Just because you put it out there, it doesn't mean you're going to be seen. You really have to go after and target an audience that's the audience of what you're writing or if you were, what you're selling or what you're promoting. Uh, it's not the strategy of just put it all out there and we'll see what sticks. It really needs to have a bit of a targeted strategy. So think about as you plan how you may want to use social media, what it is you are trying to achieve. And I don't mean at a high level. I want to sell more books. That's fine. 
Who do you want to sell them to? What's your way of selling them? How do you want to uh, get across? Are you going to go to bookstores and have readings? You know, make those sorts of approaches as part of your strategy, just as an example. And social media as a strategy is actually iterative because, you know, let's say we start at the top, you set some goals, and then you think about who your audience may be, you know, who you're trying to reach. And then you say, well, this is the platform that I think they're on. And you start writing some content and putting it out there and you implement it. And then you see the results. If it's not where you want to be, you may have to adjust. And then you have new goals or altered goals. Maybe it's a different strategy. Maybe it's a different platform. So it's a bit iterative. You may go around a few times before you really uh, get into um, a, a good, positive working situation. So realize that it is a little bit of trial and error, and it's certainly a little bit of an iterative process as creating a social media strategy. So in, in terms of uh, talking about setting goals, you certainly have to know your audience and your audience is who you want to engage with. Again, just putting information out doesn't mean you're reaching the right people. And so you need to know where your audience hangs out online, where they shop online, where they promote online, where they publish online, everything about them. So you, I bet you need to know who they are. You have to make sure that you understand that. Then you have to identify what type of content will you post. So if you have a book of poetry or prose, maybe you'll put a few of them out there. If you have a novel, fiction or, or nonfiction, maybe you'll put your first chapter out there, right? There are a lot of people who will read the first chapter of a book and be hooked or not. And so you want to hook them. Maybe you'll write supplemental information. Maybe you're writing history uh, topics in your book. So therefore, you'll write about the history, but not specifically publish the exact content in your book. You'll whet their appetite. So you have to decide what type of content. You'll also have to figure out where you're going to post, where you're going to promote. Are there specific social media websites? Or are there going to be podcasts? Or are you going to be on YouTube? Or you have to figure out what's best for you. One thing for certain, since this is an author's program, um, you can write or you should be writing because you are reaching an audience of readers. You certainly can be on video and on visual uh, uh, platforms as well, but certainly um, don't worry about your audience. They are going to be comfortable reading. And you really need to know how to use the different social media channels or the different platforms that are out there, the different tools that are out there, because each one could reach an audience a little differently. Each can reach a different type of audience. Some platforms are for older people, some are for younger people. And so you really then need to engage and use the appropriate platform the appropriate way. Uh, so as an example, YouTube is very video oriented. So you certainly can give a video, but you might not want to have a video of pages turning in your book, letting them read it on their own, because that's not quite the best use of video. So you might want to do something different, maybe read a chapter or, to, or have a discussion or a podcast. And then um, you have to think about what do you want to have happen as a result of your activity? So now that you're beginning to engage your audience, how do you want them to interact with you? How do you want them you know, to be involved with what you're writing? Um, should they contact you? Uh, do you want to point them to a bookstore where they can buy it? Uh, your, your, what you're selling. So you have to think about that as well, how to continue with the activity once you begin to uh, become found and recognized online. So I mentioned your audience. So who is your audience? Well, maybe there's a good chance one of those people are your audience. And it really is who you want to reach with social media. That's who your audience is. You want to make sure that you know who you're writing to. If you're writing uh, to, uh, let's say, an, an older group rather than a younger group, you're going to make sure that you reach out via platforms where um, older people hang out. If you're going to hang out with younger people, then maybe you're going to want to make sure it could be broadcast on a smartphone instead of a computer, because we know young people to stare at their, their phones all day long. Um, I'm 62. I like my computer more than my phone, just what I'm used to. So it's who you want to reach. And you need to understand what's important to them and how to communicate with them. 
that becomes important. So if you said, I'm going to put everything out there on my smartphone, people will be able to find me. And again, if your audience might be a 50 plus age group, they may not be as readily available on phones. As we get older, we have to wear reading glasses and stuff. It may not be as easy for us. Young people pound away on phones quickly. So you need to understand the proper way to communicate with your audience. If your audience tends to be consumer based or retail based, you know, not within an industry, um, you'll have to write to and communicate in terms that they will understand, the layperson language. Of course, if you're going to be writing about uh, industry, maybe educational type things, you can use industry terms and educational terms because your audience is a different audience. And so that becomes important as well. Um, younger audiences write differently than older audiences, although I'm of the opinion that younger audiences have lost something in the way they write. Um, my nephew, love him dearly, 24 years old, a tech person. When I get texts from him, there are no punctuations. I've got to read his text two or three times to figure out what he's writing. Uh, I, I use punctuations. So as an author, who is your audience? Who's the author's audience? And so I've got this list. It was actually from this gentleman, Kevin Cruz, who is a New York Times bestselling author. And so I had read this online and I just thought this was a, a good bit of information to share with you as well. So among the people that could be your audience, it could be what we call, or he calls, your personal reader network. These are kind of your network of fans or friends or families or clients or people that you have some form of relationship with. They may not all be your best friends. Maybe you're connected to them already on social media. Maybe you've been introduced to them uh, and connected to them on email. Maybe you met them at a conference. And so you want to reach out to them again. This may be a group of people that are important to you, your personal reader network. So for some authors, that's very important. But if you think about it, it's fairly finite. You know, you typically don't have, you know, enough friends to make money off your what you're writing. Um, you know, you have to go a little beyond that. <clears throat> then there's also the bookstore browser or the online bookstore browser. Someone that you don't know, but they might see your book and your writings as they go shopping or as they're searching the web. They come across your book and it's piqued their interest and they want to know more and they want to read more. And so this is clearly a bigger audience, certainly. It could also people who buy for others. And it's not just individuals who buy a gift for an individual, but it could be professors that are buying for students um, or for a whole curriculum. It could be executives in an office that are buying for a team. Um, I had a boss who did that. He would buy these project management books and other uh, books written by um, uh, other executives and he would give them out. So I got a couple of books from an old boss. And then there's the retail buyer, and that's not the person who's the store shopper, but this is the one who works for the retail company, like someone who buys books for Barnes & Noble and buys books for Amazon. You want to get their attention. And when you start buying, uh, getting their attention, and if they can be part of your audience, they may be able to buy and represent your, your book very uh, easily in a very large way. And then in best case, you'll get written up in the media. Hopefully you'll get your, your writing um, reviewed uh, by um, people who can make, who themselves have an audience. So you have to think about how to connect with any one of these types of people, any one of these types of audience, because the way you communicate with them, the message you send, uh, what you write to them about might be a little different and you want to make sure you get their attention properly. So there are different audiences. As you look to use social media to read, reach your audience and the different platforms, which we'll get into in a few minutes, you have to think about what is social media really about? Unfortunately, a lot of people think social media is about them, the writer. It's about me. How can you help me? How can you buy my book? Buy my book is good for me. Read my content, it's good for me. A lot of people are very selfish that way. And it's almost a natural expectation, especially when you're starting out new on platform. I'm alerting to you, alerting you about me. And while really it kind of is, 
you can't project that. You can't project yourself as being selfish. What you really need to do is make social media about them, your audience. How can I help you? The content you write should be informational to them. Your, if it's your website, you might have some information to help them understand the importance of your topic, why they should be interested in you, not just tell them you have to buy this. Similar if you have posts on Facebook or if you are going to be presenting and you want to post on Twitter or any other social media site. It all has to be about the audience because just as I said before, you can't be selfish on social media. You can't assume that a lot of people are, including a lot of people on your audience. So they're interested in looking for their own needs and help. And what you do, you provide value. You share information that's helpful to others and you don't have to post all the time doesn't have to be daily. Actually, I know someone who posts daily. I used to know someone, well, I still know him, but he used to post twice a day uh, uh, an important topic in the morning, and he had a, a quote in the afternoon. Twice. I thought it was incredible that he kept that up for a few years. And then ultimately, whether you're writing an article or a post in a, in a website or a post on a social media platform, uh, direct them to your website or direct direct them to your social media platform. If you don't yet have a website, your Facebook page or your LinkedIn page or some other uh, social media platform can be where you direct them where they can find more information out about you. But again, it's providing the quality of information, not quantity of information. The most effective platforms. Now, I can't tell you this, these are the best platforms to use for you because it's going to be a little bit specific to your audience. Uh, this was from uh, the Content Marketing Institute. Uh, this study came out about a year and a half ago. Uh, they had one a few years earlier, so this is the more current slide. If you are promoting B2B, business to business, and you are absolutely a business, you have to view yourself as a business, even though you don't, you may not consider yourself big business. But if your users, if your audience, if your readers are going to be business oriented people, and I think we can, you know, put educational institutions. So if you're trying to write to professors and students there, that would count. That's what's called B2B, business to business. The number one platform statistically is LinkedIn. So you should be on LinkedIn. You can write a lot of information on LinkedIn. You can join groups of like-minded people and contribute there. And then uh, not too far behind, Twitter and Facebook. And if you looked at this study from about um, the last one before it was 2016, um, uh, uh, Facebook was a little bit higher, but Twitter has become higher as well. YouTube and Instagram are more video and photo oriented. And so business people, not quite as much are using those. They are using it, uh, but in terms of uh, best platforms for organic searching on social media, um, LinkedIn. If you wanna read the full post, uh, when you download this slide deck, that link at the bottom is actually clickable. You can actually click on the link and it's a hot link and it'll take you to, you can read the whole article or excerpts of it that you want. And then you can see on the right side, some of the other sites you may have heard of um, you know, they're the under 10% crowd, so used a lot less from a B2B perspective. But from a business to consumer, it changes a little bit. Facebook is right up there, and that's really what Facebook is. Uh, it's very much used by end users, by people, tend to be a little less by business people. And then you see the video and imagery ones come up the, above Twitter and LinkedIn. It's the nature of um, the non-business audience. And then again, you can see the others on the right as well. So if you're gonna be promoting to a more consumer-based audience, you might try using Facebook as a first platform to start or Instagram or YouTube. You have to find what would be working for you. And again, the link at the bottom uh, will talk to you about, this is the B2C discussion. We'll talk to you, uh, you can download that or watch that as well, read that as well. That is a hot link. And you can see Pinterest is higher. Pinterest here for B2C, again, it's again visual, picture-oriented, 29%, but it was only 9% for B2B. So yeah, that's used a bit more. Oh, here's our first intermission. So do you have any questions? I haven't seen anything in chat. If you'd like to quickly unmute yourself, if 
anything that we covered um you're welcome to. yeah i do um i think if we're not strictly business we're trying to sell a book then we would concentrate on the consumer um social media locations is that correct or should we do multiple well it, it, so um i think ultimately you'll get to multiple but the challenge is social media is like that joke how do you eat a thousand pound elephant one bite at a time so social media should be started the same way because if you said well i have to be on facebook and youtube and pinterest and instagram this is overwhelming that's the thousand pound elephant but if you pick just one and you say i think my audience is going to be mostly on facebook just put your time and effort into that one get comfortable with it um yeah well i'm on facebook and linkedin and I don't really use Instagram, although I'm on it. I haven't used it to market. Okay. I have my own website. Good. Um, so I've done a lot of this, and I'm still not getting much, you know, success. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. A part of it is, and maybe I should have kept the search engine optimization slides in, but part of it is, um, I, I, I'm, I, I, well, what I would be looking at, if, if, a, if a client came to me with the same sort of challenge, yeah. is I'd want to know what keywords or phrases mm -hmm. are relevant to your audience. And are you using them regularly and repeatedly throughout your social media and on your website? And I'll give you an example. I was at a writer's conference a few years ago. I gave an earlier version of this presentation. And the a gentleman had a similar question, so we took it offline. And he said, you know what I write about? I write about fiction in historical events. So it's not a true story, but it's a story that took place mm -hmm. in, a, in, a tr in a historical event, and it's basically the Wild West. So he said, okay, Tell me some of the keywords. If I wanted to search for you, what are some of the keywords I should be using? So he named the primary characters in the book. And I said, why should I use that? He said, well, those are my characters. You should be searching for my characters to find me. And I said, I get it, but I don't know you. I don't know your, your, your book. I don't know your series. I don't know your characters. There's no way I can do that. Maybe I should be work using uh, Wild West, or you know, maybe there was a specific event like um, Little Bighorn. And he said, "Well, yeah, but my characters are really most important." So I was, he was challenged a little bit, but we talked it through. And um, so you have to think about how do other people, how might they search for someone like you? How might they search for content that you're writing? And then in the content of your pages in the content of your posts on social media, begin to use those terms uh, the way other people. Remember, social media is about them, not about you. So that would be the first thing I would be looking at. And since I haven't seen your website and we haven't really had a significant discussion, yeah. I don't know what you are on that writing. But um, for me, that's, that's my biggest, the first thing I would look at. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Anything else while we're at this intermission point? And if not, we can move on. Okay, the good news is no one walked away to get that sandwich off the screen, so that's good. So, and just like every good intermission, the curtain opens. So let's talk about some of the social media sites that authors can use. Uh, to be found. I can't promise you that any one of these are right for you or any one is better for you than others. Um, but um, the research I've done is these tend to be places where authors can be found. And some of them you'll just say are obvious and you may be there already. Amazon. Amazon started out as amazon.com 
um, 30 years ago. And uh, they are the, they started as an online bookseller and they are still the largest online bookseller. They're actually, they're actually the largest online e-seller, e-retailer. Uh, the second one is uh, walmart.com, but Amazon is known for their, um, their book, their library of books. Now on Amazon, you certainly can uh, publish and post. We'll talk a little bit about that. You can also have, if you said, I would like to have my own e-commerce website, but I can't afford it. You can actually have your own store on Amazon as well to sell things. Um, and Amazon is the biggest e-commerce platform for others as well. There are almost a million independent stores. Um, so they have three self-publishing services. And this may be places that you can use to promote and post um, what you're writing. And this again is a hot link, so you can get more information from the link. One is you can publish through Kindle. Kindle is completely free. It's basically their online uh, book seller. So they have a Kindle app, which is kind of their e-reader, um, or they have um, uh, a Kindle device, which is kind of like a tablet e-reader, and it is a free place where you can publish um, your works and your books. So if you're not yet publishing uh, through any sort of online means, this may be a good place to do that. You can offer up a price and you know for selling it. Amazon will, of course, take a percentage of it. But what you want to do is get a little bit of traction and a little bit of attention. So this may be uh, an idea. You can get completely start, started completely for free. Another that they have is they call public, publish the print. And so what they could do is you're not printing books until people basically are ready to buy them. You know, it's kind of done that way. And so um, the process really is it's free to set up. The account is free um, and pricing is based on the number of pages that you're printing uh, per copy and number of copies that you're printing. So you do have to look at their website to see if you want to do publish to print. But one thing that's kind of nice is it allows you to not have to maintain an inventory up front. And so you could have a print copy of the book available. So maybe if you know you're going to go to a book signing or book reading, you can print a number of copies ahead of time and bring them with you or have them delivered. And audiobooks. And uh, audiobooks is uh, a great way of getting your information out there because people more and more are using maybe reading in, in a car while they're driving, so they're listening or, um, or commuting. So it's easy for them to just listen through their phone or their iPod or anything else that they have. Um, uh, Amazon has a service called ACX. It's basically audible. Um, but when you do the publishing side of it, um, they have a couple of different pricing models. It actually can be completely free, um, but what you're doing is giving up a larger percentage of the pricing and the royalty. So just be aware. Or you can work with one of their publishers and uh, producers and uh, pay a fee for working with them. You can also pay a fee for working with uh, a specific narrator. And then uh, because you're paying more upfront, you're keeping much more of the royalty and pricing uh, upon selling. So you have to see what makes sense for you. But Amazon does have these three self-publishing services. So these could be other platforms for you to get your book a little bit of attention. I had learned something also from a friend of mine who is a publishing consultant. In Amazon, you do have the <clears throat> ability to select the category or genre of your book. And so, you know, that may help people find your book as long as you categorize it properly. But she told me something interesting. What she advises her clients is use a very unusual category, or if you can, see if you can create a category of your own. And so this way, you have very little competition in the category. And then maybe for a week or a month, you give away the book in that category. So instead of just being poetry, you know, maybe there's a subtype or subcategory of that. And it could be, you know, I think um, 
uh, Louisa said, uh, academic poetry or academic institution poetry. Create a, you know, where there may not be a lot of competition. Give away the book for free, maybe for a week or for a month in that uh, very tight category, and then move it back into a category that maybe it really should be in, maybe if it is poetry. By giving it away to free and advertising, you may have the most sales in that very unusual category. And then as part of your promotion of the book, you could say number one in this category. And it's true, it's not number one forever, but it was number one because the giving it away for free triggered a lot of sales or downloads. And then all of a sudden your numbers go up for a short period of time. And now you've got a sales promotion point to talk about. So you may want to consider doing that on Amazon or others as well. Becomes and the people may be interested. Amazon has another service called Author Central. Again, this is a hot link. And so in Author Central, basically you're creating your own home page. And you've probably seen that. Open up, uh, go to a book on Amazon, and you may find that the author's name next to the book is a link. And you click on that, and it's a page that talks about the author. So you could put your own kind of home page on Amazon. So it's your home page on Amazon. You can add your bio, your photos. Um, links to your blog or website, whatever information that they allow, you could put that there so people can find out about you and find out more about you right while they're in Amazon. It also then gives you the ability to track your sales data in uh, Amazon. So if you have several publications and they're all uh, linked together through the um, Office Central, you'll be able to monitor your trends right through there. And um, they also have staff that will answer your questions. So you get um, email or, or phone support uh, from them. So if you need some guidance or advice, they'll be able to help you with that as well. Um, I haven't had to use it myself, uh, again, because I'm not writing where I would publish on or promote on Amazon. Um, I'm, I wouldn't surprise me if the support that they give you is limited to how best to use any of the Amazon services. Uh, so just be aware that if you have a more generic question, they may not be able to help you with that. Audible. Um, Audible.com is now an Amazon company. Again, this is a hot link, um, but it is a way um, for um, a seller and producer of spoken audio entertainment. So it's basically like an ebook kind of thing or downloadable. And that's what Audible allows you to do. Um, you can sell or listen to digital books, radio programs, TV programs, magazines, newspapers, all these audio versions of all these different other media can be available through Audible and you can post your own information as well. Um, it also links up now with Amazon because of the relationship. So it does create a very tight link. So as you build up your Amazon profile, your Audible profile will link. And um, it's a 30-day free trial. So when you're ready to consider using Audible, try it for 30 days. See if it works or not. If it does, uh, then it'll be uh, $14.95 a month. That's their price. And uh, if you are a Prime member, so if you're using Prime for shipping or other Amazon services through Prime, uh, their audio and you know streaming movies and stuff, um, the prices are discounts or sometimes they give you specials. Um, you know, so you can look at that as well. The specials change all the time. Goodreads, uh, another great program, again, owned by Amazon. Amazon's been buying up uh, the competitors. Don't know when it's going to be a monopoly, but it's an audience of more than 90 million book lovers. And um, what they do is they want to really, it's a platform for people to share uh, books, rate and review books and find, uh, as a result, find things to read as well. If you are an end user, it is completely free. You can add books to, they call it your bookshelf, it's kind of your list. You can provide ratings and reviews. Uh, as you build up a network of friends in Goodreads, you can refer to them or see what they're reading. Um, so you can get, this, excuse me, suggestions as well. And uh, if you wanna promote, your writing and your books, you can, <clears throat> and it's called pay-per-click, which basically is, excuse me, all of a sudden got the hiccups. Um, you're basically paying uh, when, not for the advertisement, but if someone clicks on the advertisement to read it. 
and I don't know what the pricing is. You'll have to look at it. Wouldn't surprise me if it's, you know, pennies per click, but you do have to be careful with some of these pay-per-click advertising that people aren't clicking like crazy. So make sure you understand the advertising model. We are going to talk more about pay-per-click you know, in a few slides from now, so you'll get that information a little bit later. Uh, another one is issue.com. Issue.com, again, their mission, connecting content with people, very similar to what um, we just read. And so it's a digital pub, public, <coughs> excuse me, publishing platform, and you can publish all sorts of quote unquote printed media, newspapers, magazines, uh, you can put your portfolios out there, catalogs, uh, do-it-yourself guides, all sorts of information, whatever it is that you would like to publish. They do include publishing tools to help you get your content online. And again, you start free, um, and actually they do have a free subscription, and they call it unlimited. It's unlimited uploads, but the uploads files are, are limited in size. You may not be able to put big documents out there for the free, but you can get yourself started. Also, the free version are going to have pop-up ads and other things. You may be fine with that at the beginning. Um, to get many more features, to get rid of the ads, prices start at $19 a month. And by the way, the prices that I'm telling you, I actually did validate all of these um, earlier this week. So they're all current. Scribed, another one, again, hot link. Um, it's an online reading subscription. And again, like the others, it will work on any device. So if you like carrying a, your smartphone around or a tablet, a little iPad might be a little smaller than a computer, a laptop computer. Um, they have over 500,000 audio and print book titles available to you. Okay. Um, it, the members are basically everybody in the uh, reading and writing community. Uh, so including publishers and editors are there as well. You can publish up to uh, documents up to 100 megabytes in size. Give or take, that's about 500 pages. So, you know, unless you're writing very large documents, um, any one docu document could be up to about 500 pages. So pretty big content. Um, and for this unlimited subscription, uh, $9.99 a month. You do get a 30-day free trial. They may want to look at Scribe to see if they may be worthy for you as well. And uh, Kindle Unlimited, that's basically the ebook version of Amazon. So there are over a million ebooks that are available through Kindle. And Amazon, again, also has their own tablet that's for Kindle. I have the Kindle app on my phone. Uh, so you can, uh, people with the Kindle app can just read on their own phone or tablet. Okay. And basically, unlimited reading and listening on any device. So you can use your computer, your smartphone, whatever it is that you want. So basically, you can download and read from anywhere. Some top, some titles are completely free. Um, in order to get um, their most robust platform that, um, to have basically their content available, um, it's $9.99 a month. I happen to see they do have a special being promoted right now. First six months are only $30. Basically, it's a 50% off. So you know, if you want to start publishing your uh, books and, and writings, on Kindle, uh, your Kindle audience will be able to read it using the Kindle product as well. What about some of the other well-known big platforms that are out there for social media? A lot of them are out there. Again, we're only going to touch on them a little bit. Uh, Facebook, bottom line, is the largest social media platform on the planet. Almost 3 billion users on, on Facebook. At least that was the end of 2020. So I didn't update that number. So it's going to be a little bit more right now. But, you know, more than about a third of the planet has a Facebook account. And about 65% of U.S. residents have a Facebook account. So if your audience are going to be um, in the United States, certainly of the English-speaking world, uh, right here, that's where, you know, Facebook is a good place that you could use to reach your consumer-based audience. Remember, it is the number one platform for B to C, business to consumer, and it has been that way for a long, long time. LinkedIn. LinkedIn has over 740 million users in 200 countries. It tends to be more for a business 
real, uh, re related audience. You tend to have less of an ability to put photos and things like that. You put more um, documents up as well. Um, links to your website and other social media site. Um, you also get to put a little bit of a either um, a resume or portfolio on LinkedIn. Uh, you can format it the way that makes the most sense for you. And you can also connect with communities, they call them groups, of like-minded people. You may want to connect with more authors or editors and publishers, or you may want to connect with people interested in the genre that you're interested in. So just like that gentleman I talked about a little bit earlier, uh, if you're interested in reading about the Wild West, find groups in the wild, talk about the Wild West, meet people there and start posting, getting, getting your name out there. And some groups in LinkedIn are very, very large. Um, I do belong to a project managers group that's over 900,000 users. So when I post, up to 900,000 people could be reading what I post. Not all groups are that large. But some of them can get quite big. Could help reach a very large audience very quickly. Twitter. Um, you can inform your followers of things like um, an upcoming event, recent accomplishment. You generally can't write a lot because it limits you to 240 characters. We sometimes call that microblogging because you can't really write a lot. But what you certainly can do is write up to 240 characters. You can also put a link. So you might say something like, I'll be at the Barnes & Noble in Princeton to do a book reading and give away copies. Click this link to find out more. That'll certainly fit within 240 characters. Now, they measure their user base a little differently. Rather than telling you how many users they have, they report how many active users there are. So uh, Twitter is known to have somewhere about the 350 million user range, but they report that they have about 192 active daily users. And of course, there's some people that are active, but less often than daily. But a great platform to reach a, a pretty large audience. You might be interested in blogging. That's a platform I like. Uh, for me, um, I don't mind writing a page. Uh, I don't think I've got a book in me. I, I, I just haven't been inspired to write a book. Although someone said I should take, I've got over 100 blog posts, they should put them all together and make a book, maybe, uh, just hasn't been of interest of, to, for, to pursue it. But a blog, it's a website, or it could be a page on your website that allows you to write these little short articles, and well, not little short, but generally not hundreds of pages, and these articles are called posts. So uh, you can provide information to your readers. Maybe it's, I like writing a few short paragraphs. You know, I'll say uh, 500 to 1,000 words probably is pretty good. Um, you can write your opinion. Um, generally, you don't write something new. If you're going to discover something, don't put it in a blog. Go to a journal in an industry about whatever it is you're discovering. You may want to put snippets of your book. One of my clients is an author, and we put a couple of chapters, the first couple of chapters of her book online. Um, and you can post it on your own site. If you don't have yet your own blog page or blog site, maybe find someone else who does that's in your genre, um, or find other websites that will allow you to post. Some do, because they're looking for content. And it also blogging supports your your brand it demonstrates your interests things that you're passionate about so blogging is really um can be very helpful it's a little bit hard to make money on blogging not impossible so people want to monetize blogs you can you have to tie advertising to it most cases and then the flip side is some people don't want the advertising associated with it so a lot of times i prefer and i tell my clients use blogging to supplement and promote rather than for directly monetizing. It's to support your brand and your interests and in what you're writing about. Oh, our next intermission, there it is. Any more questions at this point or any questions at all? Maybe I should start playing Jeopardy. Yeah, I have a, okay. go ahead. Person go. Yeah, yeah, what is that, the question? Um, I used to for when I when I had uh, in a previous job I used to manage Google Ads. Oh yeah, and We're I'm wondering about whether the whether the Goodreads paperclip ads work on the bid system the way Google Ads do. 
I don't exactly know, but it wouldn't surprise me if it's very close. But I can't tell you because I, I haven't worked with Goodreads. I haven't had a client that's asked me to help and I haven't had a need with it myself. So uh, Google, as you know, can get uh, very specific where your ads get posted and, and how long and limit your budget. Um, I just don't have the information about Goodreads. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah. And you know, now, uh, other social I, media. Yeah, go ahead. Now I was going to ask how you get your book on scribed and uh, is it a website? Um, it's a plat. There are platforms that ha have tools that help you post your content. What are they? Do we have a list? What? Are, in, well, they are scribed uh, issue Goodreads. They are a website, right? www.issue.com. So that's how you get to them, you know, to access. It's all online. Right. Is the blogging on their website then? Is that what you're talking about? I'm, I'm not sure how to blog. Oh, I see. The blog I was thinking is more, more tied to you directly. So it's a place maybe you'll have a page on your website where you can put your own blog posts. Oh, okay. It's on our website then. So, yeah. Um, I don't know that any of these bigger platforms like Issue, Goodreads, and the like have a blog section where they invite authors um, to contribute. Um, generally, the types of bloggers that invite authors are individuals and platforms that don't have a big audience just yet, and they're asking others to contribute to their content. Okay, so say you put your book on several of these websites that cost $10 a month. That's without advertising or marketing. So just your book is on their website. Is that correct? It's another place where you can be found. From a search engine optimization point of view, um, like in the Google world, the more places you can be found, the more Google begins to understand what this thing, your book, is about. And then when someone Googles a topic that's of the genre of your book or has you as the author or whatever it is that people search on to find you or someone that, or, or your genre, Google assembles all the un, its understanding from all these other places wow. and then decides if I should put you higher up in the list or further back in the list. So you want to be found in other places. And remember, you those keywords I mentioned before, you want them to be common, commonly used and repeated across the different platforms you're going to be on. Um, because social media, or I'm sorry, because search engine optimization being found in an automated fashion online, um, these tools like Google and Bing and the others, the search engines, have to kind of say, ah, if that's what this is about. I'll serve this one up on the first page or the second page. Mm -hmm. That's interesting because um, you could be spending, do 10 of these for 100 a month, which is 1,200 a year, and be getting quite a bit of attention, which is relatively right. low compared to marketing costs. But do remember at the beginning, we talked about you do have to have a social media strategy. So if you're going to be on a couple of these, <clears throat> $10 a month, and you're on 10 of them for $1,200, are your audience on 12 of them or 10 of them? Or right. is most of, you know, like the 80-20 rule, is most of your audience on three? Are they on two? Yeah, so I don't you, know. Yeah, well, yeah. So, I, I, you know, we can't discover your audience in a session like this. It's something that you're going to have to understand and find on your own. But again, think about um, if you know what your genre is, um, Google, use Google and search. And don't search for you, but search to see if your competitors come up. And I don't mean search for them by name. Right. So, you know, if you're doing science fiction, don't search for Arthur C. Clarke because Arthur C. Clarke will come up if you search for Arthur C. Clarke. You might search for science fiction or fantasy, you know, and then you'll get these broad terms and then narrow it down a little bit. It might be, um, you know, 
science fiction and magic or uh, science fiction and space. You know, you, you might hone it a little bit. And when you start seeing websites in the list coming up in Google that you say, yeah, that's kind of like mine. Now you've kind of figured out how people should are typically searching for you. The reason why you figured that out is Google figured it out and said, I'm serving up this information on the results based on what I understand people want to see when they search on this term. And then that search term you'll want to add in different places in your online activity. Okay. Is that clear? David. Kind yeah. of. It's a big topic, search engine optimization. But yeah, really yeah. what you want to be able to do is begin to understand how other people search for you. So an easy way is search and see if either your competitors or your like-minded people, if you if you yeah. said, oh, yeah, I would read that if I was looking for someone like me. Mm -hmm. And once you get a bunch of those, um, then you know the term you're using is probably pretty close to be used okay. for you. And those two or three words you put in Google to get that result set, Put that in your website, in your social media posts, all those places. Your about me section, your so your your um, your bio on Facebook, your bio on LinkedIn. You know, put those same search words a few times. Yes, yeah, Stephen. Um, are you going to talk about Bookshop.org? I was not. I'm going to talk about it the next time I teach this class. I guess. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, Bookshop.org is another online uh, bookseller, and um, the thing that uh, that is appealing about them is that they give a percentage of their profits, I think it's 10%, to local uh, brick-and-mortar bookstores. Ooh. And um, so the, the, the liberal readership is getting more and more interested in switching from Amazon to Bookshop.org, and authors can... Um, post their books on bookshop.org and then you choose the bookstore you want to get your money for your sales okay. oh okay well oh, good thank you for letting me know okay so another platform so hopefully all of you all have gotten that as well okay anything else during this intermission Okay, we will move on. And as a reminder, just keep yourself on mute for accidental, no accidental background noise. Let's talk about websites a little bit. And um, actually, if you go to my my own website, I'll give you the link later where you can get this slide deck. The slide deck from last week, which will be the one below it, um, I did a presentation for SCORE on websites, best practices and tips. So we're touching a little bit on that, but you can watch that presentation or at least look at that slide deck. Uh, I don't have the recorded presentation for that just yet, um, but you can get that slide deck to get more tips about websites. But we're gonna to touch on some of those items right here. So you certainly want it to be what's called mobile or responsive design. You want it to be such that uh, when your website opens on different size screens, whether it's a, a PC monitor or a tablet, which is more square, or a smartphone, which is more vertical, um, you want the website to be able to adjust its size a little bit better so it's easy to read on these devices. If you have an older website, it may not. And so when you open up the browser on your small phone, it might become like an eye chart. Newer websites, the browser, I'm sorry, the themes that are used will be responsive. Younger the, the younger the audience, the more they're going to be on a smaller device like a smartphone than they will on a large computer. And so the content, the layout uh, adapts to the device and the screen size. As an example, your website might have three images side by side, but as it goes from widescreen to narrow screen, it might automatically adjust them to be on top of each other. So they're not teeny tiny side by side, but they're a little bit bigger on top of each other, taking up the full screen. So for us as developers, it's the most flexible way to design websites. Uh, you go back a few years ago, sometimes it costs more money to do it, a few extra bucks. It shouldn't now. So if any of you ever work with a web designer and they say, well, if you want responsive, I'm going to charge you more money. Um, 
no, don't do that. Also, keep in mind, a younger audience prefers smaller devices. So you do want to make sure that a younger audience, the millennials, um, and 20% of millennials have been reported to not even have a, a large desktop computer. So you want to be able to reach them and have them be on a platform that's comfortable for them. And now about the content, you want to be descriptive, certainly. You don't want to be too wordy, especially on your home page or the pages that are, you know, if you imagine your website is a bit of a hierarchy, a home page with a menu, and then the menu has a few each points to another page. The further down the hierarchy you go, the more wordy you can get away with. But on the home page, you just can't, you know, you you haven't reeled them in yet. You haven't gotten them past the first chapter. So you want to be descriptive, but not very wordy. We talked about this before. You want to use keywords and key phrases that people use, the words others may use. So don't use the words that you would use to easily find you. Use the words that someone who doesn't know you, try and find yourself uh, in a way that, you know, imagine you don't know yourself yet. Um, add video and images for, for um, interest. So if you happen to have a video uh, post of some sort or a YouTube video, you can put that right in the middle and they can press the play button. Or maybe you've got some images or the cover of your book or other images that are descriptive, you know, pictures worth a thousand words that can kind of uh, evoke the theme or feeling about your book may be helpful as well. And, you know, you certainly want to add links to other websites. Uh, this is good for a couple of reasons. For one, Google search engine optimization likes it. In other words, you're not just getting people off of your website. You want to click to other sites that are relevant to yours, that are, have a relationship. It could be your social media site. It could be um, your Amazon page, your author's um, page. So it could be that. Um, it could be, especially if you're writing about historical events, links to other history pages of the same sort of era or events. And what Google will see is that you've built a relationship between your website and similar content. And it says, oh, you may be a candidate to be a little higher up in a Google search. And your web content must tell a story. And I don't mean that literally as if you're writing, but the, the theme of what you put in of your writing from page to page to page must be similar. Again, if you're writing about Wild West history, then I would say your whole website, no matter how many web pages, must be about Wild West history. If you also like pets and gardening, don't have a pet page on your website and a gardening website web page and a Wild West history web page. Don't mix it up. The topics are too different. It'll only confuse Google. It'll confuse your readers. You're going to lo lose interest in both. So you're going to want to keep all the information very similar. You can put calls to action on your website. Calls to action are really some sort of image or text or push button or something that en enables your reader, your user of the website, to interact with the website. So instead of just reading, you may be offering them, you know, download a free version of my book, sign up for my newsletter. If you're selling your book online, it could be to your you know, bookseller page or offer them you know, free shipping, something to engage them. It'll keep them on your website longer, which certainly will help with your analytics. So we're gonna talk about analytics in a moment. Um, Stephen raised that a little bit earlier. <clears throat> so in a, in any effective call to action, it really increases the effectiveness of your message. That's what statistically has shown, been shown. Now, if you're interested in selling online your, your writings in your book, uh, certainly you can do it as an Amazon page, and we talked about that. You can do it on your own website as well. And anytime you sell online, that's called e-commerce. It's the buying and selling of products and services through the internet. And that's basically what it is. It's also known as online shopping, and I'm sure everyone here has done that in some form or another. And what's nice about it is there's no barrier, right? The online store doesn't close. The online store doesn't have to be in the neighborhood. People can buy from you 
no matter where they're located and in no matter where you're located in relation to them. So no barriers of distance or time. Now there are some pretty good e-commerce tools that are out there. eBay, you may have heard of this. eBay is an online auction site, or that's what it used to be, and you could still do auctions. They just don't do as many as they used to. They've really become an online shopping website. So you could buy it now, you know, sell things. You might say, I've got 100 copies of my book, I'm selling it for $9.99 and let people buy. Now, eBay does take a percentage of the sale. On the other hand, you didn't have to build a website, an e-commerce website. So that's kind of a little bit of a trade-off. Another place is Amazon. You can create your own store in Amazon. And this is actually one that I use. So uh, I bought this mat, this was a couple of years ago, this outdoor mat, uh, and it was sold through Amazon, but not by Amazon. It was by that company, Mats Factory. And so I bought that outdoor mat. And so there are about, or almost about a million uh, online stores that are uh, through Amazon, just go to amazon.com. Amazon does take a big percentage. I don't remember what it is right now, but takes a percentage of the sale. But again, you're using the service otherwise for free. So you're only basically paying for when you're selling. Now you could add e-commerce to your own website, and that's certainly very possible to have buy it now buttons. And uh, this one is actually a client of mine. And these buy it now buttons went to her uh, PayPal account. And so once they paid for whatever the service is that they were acquiring, uh, it paid credit card or check through the PayPal. She got paid and the person got their um, coaching sessions. And you could do the same thing with selling your book, you, either through PayPal or through a, a web page that you set up on your own website. You can also build uh, a website, and instead of using, I don't know what you're using now, but like um, instead of using Wix or Weebly or WordPress or one of the big web design tools, and a lot of them have e-commerce, these platforms, Shopify, BigCommerce, Volusion, these are web development platforms where the websites are supposed to be e-commerce. So they're web development platforms for selling stuff. And even to the thing like clothing, where you could sell one shirt in different colors and different sizes. Um, you could sell your book through it as well. Um, Shopify is the biggest of the platform. Uh, their hosting platform is, uh, it starts at about $29 a month, and most people can get away with that without a problem. So it does the web hosting and gives you all the tools for selling online. So if you want to have your own e-store, online store, you can do that as well. Some e-commerce best practices and that other program that I talked about a little bit earlier about, e about website uh, types and best practices talks about this in greater detail. But you certainly want to make a good first impression. You want to have good copy, good text, keywords that people will search and find, good images. I don't know that this guy is uh, making a good impression. Um, you certainly want to make sure you use a platform that will display well on mobile devices. A lot of the modern ones will. You also want to be able to have reviews. So if someone likes what you uh, are selling, they can tell, say so, and then others will read the reviews as well. Reviews validate just uh, how good or of, of how much interest someone has uh, in the product that they just purchased. Also, you want to make sure you have an easy way, reliable way to, to purchase. People shouldn't have to be going through hoops. Um, my opinion is put the price right on the product page. Um, some stores don't put the price on the product page. They say put it in the shopping cart so you can read the price. I don't like that because if you don't like the price, then you got to take it out of the shopping cart before you complete your sale of other items. Um, maybe have uh, uh, appealing shipping options, you know, fixed price shipping, free shipping, and make sure they can check out fairly quickly and easily. And also be prepared to fulfill the orders. Um, if you wind up selling something and you all, all of a sudden get a lot of orders, if you sell your book and you don't have enough printed copies of your book, um, you're going to make people a little unhappy because it'll take a while for them to get it. They'll be back ordering. And that may be a little bit of a turnoff. So make sure you can fulfill properly. There's different ways of doing fulfillment with e-commerce, and you have to find out what the best way is for you. 
So which social media platform is the one that is best for you? And a lot of people think this is the most important slide of the program. And I kind of think it could be very important. It is a very important slide. But if you're waiting to find out what the best media, social media platform is, you're not going to get that answer. The reason why is, you first of all, you can't be on every social media platform. So you want to be on the one that's really right for you. But the best one is you have to determine the one that's most relevant to your audience. What is your genre? Where do they go to find out? Where does your audience go? Where are your competitors? If you start searching for a genre similar to you, for a writing that's similar to yours, and you start Googling it or using Bing or other platforms, and you start finding kind of your competition, then you pretty much know where your audience is because your audience is going to be where your competitors are. And your competitors have probably figured this out already because they've done it a little longer than you. That's why they're there and you're not. So make sure you find out the one that's best for you. And you'll have to try. It's try, try, try. Experiment, measure. If you're not getting good results, you may have to adjust. We're going to talk a little bit about how you can measure some of that. So um, it does take a little bit of time. It is an organic process. It's not the kind of thing where you put, put your ad out there and all of a sudden the ads, I'm sorry, the purchases will come flowing in, but they will occur over time. You'll find some things work well, stick with it. Some things don't work well. Some platforms don't work well. Don't put the, your time and energy in those. Just not worth it for, for your audience, for you and your audience. So what do you do? What's the next thing to do? The next thing is pick one tool. Even if you've already started with two or three tools, pick one, unless you're really good at those tools. And the reason why is, again, it, you know, social media is the thousand pound elephant. It's just too big to imagine how you're going to get started when you're looking at this big blob of social media all in its entirety. Pick that one tool and create an account. In many cases, creating the account is free. And a lot of the services, they're free anyway. You may need how-to assistance. Maybe you can find webinars like on YouTube or Vimeo or other places. Maybe ask other people you know that are using that platform. You can find some classes, either in person or online, um, or hire a consultant who's good at um, social media marketing or marketing in general. And then get started with that one. Move forward with that one. Let's also talk about analytics. So now that you've got maybe your website, you've got some social media visibility that's starting, you want to know, are you effective? Well, one way to really know if you're effective is, is your website getting views? Right? Um, are your social media sites and posts getting views? Of course, if you're getting orders and sales, you know that your promoting is working as well but you may not quite be getting a lot of conversions. And just because you're getting website views, not all of them turn into uh, sales conversions. So we'll talk a little bit about analytics. And it's really a, a way to be able to monitor the performance of anything that you have online. You can't monitor the performance of other websites and other social media platforms, but you can monitor the performance of everything that you quote unquote own, your website, your pages. And what you want to do is see the effectiveness. How effective is the, are the programs that you put in place? Um, find the ones that are working. Are you seeing over time, month after month, that you're getting more views and more hits? Are you starting to get more emails and phone calls and purchases? And so when you look at the analytics, it'll see, it'll show you over time, are you staying the same? Are you improving? Or are you not improving? Now, they can't tell you what to do about it. But you can make, the information can help you make decisions, uh, more relevant and timely decisions, and then focus your time on the things that are working and focus less of your time or avoid altogether things that are not working. And basically, you ask yourself, am I achieving my goals with social media? If you're achieving them, fine. If you're not, remember right at the beginning, we had that iterative process. And it may be time to think about is it time to just update some of what I'm promoting using different keywords, visiting a different website to promote and such.
You have to find out for you what's best. So uh, Google Analytics is a tool that is completely free. Uh, does it cost anything? No, it is completely free. Google, uh, it's free. And the reason why is um, Google wants the statistics because it uses it for its own purposes. It's not going to get your phone number. It's not going to get your social security number. That's not what they're looking for. They're looking to be a more effective Google search engine or uh, search engine. And the way they do it mm -hmm. is to make sure that people are using the platform. So they give this away for free. Then in turn, you get to log on to your Google Analytics website. It's uh, not your website. It's the, the Google Analytics. And you get to see about the attention you're getting. Where are your visitors coming from? How long are they staying on your website? Which web pages are they looking at? If you've got links on your pages, are they clicking on them? Are they bouncing? In other words, are they coming to your site and then bouncing right off, not staying there very long? Um, a bounce rate is not good. That means that they, for whatever reason, your advertisement doesn't meet their needs. They see your site and they go away from it. But if your bounce rate is low, they're hanging around. They're, you're interested. So you want to see that information, the information that you're promoting. On social media, you have things like uh, what they call social engagement. How many clicks are you getting? How many views? How many likes, follows, comments? All those things uh, are a part of the social media site analytics. How many impressions? How many people are reading your, your content and seeing your content and anything that you're promoting? The social media sites is giving that to you. The reason why they're giving you this information, they want you to use the site more. If you use the site more, you'll tell your friends and it'll increase their user base. And so that's what they want to do. You have to decide what to do with the information. The social media uh, analytics, the Google analytics is not gonna tell you, do this, do that, do the other thing, because it's not gonna understand your goals and other information. So you'll have to do that. Or you can work with a social media consultant who can help you uh, focus on that. And fine tune and adjust your strategy as needed. Fine tune and adjust your site content as needed. Remember that iterative circle from the beginning of this presentation. Okay. So as we wrap up, social media using the internet to share information or for people to use information, to share information with others. That's what social media is about. It includes your website. It could include e-commerce, social media platforms, and some of those other book-specific social media and author-specific social media platforms and more. You do want to monitor and tweak your performance. You'll use the right tool or tools to do that. And by the way, this is not a daily exercise. Once a month is enough. Um, you could do it a little less frequently if you'd want, but you want to monitor the performance of your content and everything that you're putting out there. And this can be overwhelming. It is the thousand pound elephant. Uh, so start with one. Once you get good with using the one platform, then switch to another one. Then you'll add a second one. And then when you get comfortable with that, you'll add a third. So you will develop the ability to manage that 500 pound, that thousand pound elephant over time but start a little bit slowly, get comfortable, get good at it. Remember, it's an organic process, so it does take a little bit of time. Okay, so this is my website, princetontechadvisors.com. And if you wanna download this slide deck, it's right here. On the menu, you click workshops, and then this page will open and you'll click recently offered programs. All of my programs from this year are listed. So this one will be the one right at top. Uh, if not by later, probably by tomorrow, I'll have the video of this presentation. So if you do want to go back and watch the video, it is going to be on my YouTube channel, but I'll post the link right on this same page, recently offered programs. And um, yeah, there's just my contact information again. So while we still have uh, a little bit of time, if you'd like, any other questions? Anything you're curious about or need to be a little bit more thorough, I need to be thorough on. I have a question and a, and a couple of resources to share. Oh, cool. Um, the first the question is, do you have a URL for the Amazon, um, uh, for creating your own store on Amazon? 
I, I when the slide was up, I didn't notice it, but it went away fast enough that I, I'm not sure I missed it or not. Well, that's actually done through Amazon.com. I don't think I had a, a, the Amazon.com link on that slide. Um, right. Let's see. Because their, their site map is really dense, and sometimes it's a little hard to find your way through it. Um, the two resources that I wanted to share with the other writers is um, a site called authors.com. Um, I haven't, I've only just registered and I don't really know exactly what, what good it is, but it's, it's services to authors and um, there may be some um, value to it. Um, the other is um, the, the, I've gone to the websites. I, I'm a, I, right now I'm publishing poetry, and I've gone to the websites that of poets who write poetry like mine. And um, and I write how some nonfiction. Find, how did you find those? Um, I mean, kind of initially, how did you find them? Uh, I think I don't really remember. I think I googled. Um, some keywords like um, nature poetry. Okay. And I came across a journal that's now defunct called Eco Poetics. And the Eco Poetics website, even though it was no longer being maintained, had a year's worth of poets published and, um, and names. And there's also a couple of websites that are just for poets. They're basically directories of, of poets and their websites. If they have their own website, um, it's on that um, aggregator website. And uh, when, I've, when I found a fellow named David Abrams who writes um, sort of in my field, I discovered that he had he was the key person for um, it's basically an institute on environmentalism and they feature authors and um, you can submit your book to them they have a submission period you submit a book to them and if they like you then they put you on your on their website it's like even better than having a review sure. and so the tip is to, to hunt down writers who write like you do and see if their websites, if they have one, and most of them do, um, link to anything else that might be useful for you to get your work published. Because a lot of them have, um, you know, sidebars that have external links to stuff that's related to what they write. Well, thank you very much for sharing that. And the reason why a moment ago, I just kind of interrupted you and asked, how did you find these um, authors and poets that are similar to you was just to demonstrate to all of us, that's a way to begin to find out what may be the proper keywords that you want to put in your posts, in your website, any place that you're writing and publishing online so that Google will begin to associate you with those search terms. Also, once you find somebody who writes like you, you can go to their web page on Amazon and look at the um, other people who bought this also liked. Oh, yep, yep, good idea. But that helps you find others. That's not quite the organic way of how people can find you until you start becoming someone else, someone that somebody else purchased. Right. So, you know, it's, it's, it's important, but not as much as you get started time to time. Yep. Thank you. Anything else, very, folks? Um, this is a lot of this is new to me and it was very helpful. Um, I'm kind of going on my own and trying to see what I can do to improve marketing my book. It's a memoir. Um, yeah, and you know, this really was meant to be a bit of a high-level introduction. 
Um, it, it's a lot to digest, which is why yeah. I didn't want to deep dive into a lot of information. I'm hopeful that you begin to digest a little bit of it and get a sense of uh, a next step that may make sense for each of you to have that next step. Yeah, I think publishing in the pandemic has been difficult also because you can't do anything in person. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, if you're comfortable, um, you know, you said, gee, I'd really like to be sitting in a read in a bookstore and read a chapter of my book. You, you can do that virtually, you know, with something like Zoom or one of the other sessions uh, tools. Uh, but you also have to promote it. Not much different than if you said, I'm going to be in my local bookstore and hopefully mm, people okay. will sign up. Like a virtual so, book. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So, you know, these tools, we're lucky we have a pandemic in the time when we've got these virtual connectivity tools. Yeah, but, if this was a pandemic point, internet is everything, it seems, for today. If, if this was a, pan, a pandemic like this happened, and this is just monumental, of course, 20 years ago, mm. we would be sitting on our thumbs. I mean, you know, we wouldn't even, at the beginning, we wouldn't even have been allowed to go to the video store. <laughs> so uh, we, we would have been very bored very quickly. Yep. Anything else, folks, uh, before we wrap up? Going once, going twice. Okay, no worries at all. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I appreciate that you had the opportunity to do so and uh, that I wasn't showing up all by myself today. So that was very nice. I uh, appreciate, appreciate your questions and your, your uh, participating as well. Uh, so here's my contact information. You're welcome to contact me if you'd like. Like I said, on my website, if you want to download the slide deck, you're welcome to it. Uh, just wait another day or so and the video will be there in case you want to go back to it. Uh, the video won't have live links, but the, the PDF of the slide deck does. So if that's helpful, uh, certainly feel free. Um, but if nothing else, I'll simply say uh, have a good night. And uh, thanks for participating with the Princeton Adult School. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.